thank you as ever, um, everyone, for joining us today again for our every month, third Friday presentation on human trafficking. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today because this is the this is a really great time in our community. It's the third day of a series of three days of events and awareness activities that stack and our community partners have been participating in called Imagine Freedom. So I wanna really just say thanks to everybody who's been part of that effort and all you've done to uh, just to help educate everybody in the community about the fact that human trafficking is here in the Big Bend of Florida and that we all have a role to play. So the first thing to know is that this is um, a program that we do every month on the third Friday. And this is part of the Big Ben Coalition Against Human Trafficking's work here locally. Many of you, and I can see that people are um, chatting in from really every many different places around Florida. And we often get people from, um, from other outside the state of Florida as well. Anyway, I hope you all have a coalition locally to work with because this is really at the heart of what our program's about today, which is it does really take a village and all of us working together to address this issue. For those of us who are local know that um, this, these are details about BBCAD, the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking, and we'd love for you to join us. Um, our next meeting is going to be uh, November 4th. Uh, we meet um, via Zoom now until further notice. And one of the things that we'd like you to do is just um, contact Kelly Doherty. You can see her contact information there, or we'll have mine um, later as well. Or you can put in the chat that you want to be a part of BBCAT. We'd really love for you to be there. Um, you know, and one of the things that we face, I think everybody does in our country, which is how do you really help inspire trust and in what you're doing in your community so that survivors come forward? Survivors know that you exist. Survivors know that we all exist to be supporting them. And what can we all do? So that's been a focus of our work at the Big Bend Coalition, which I help co-chair with our U.S. Attorney's Office. So that's a bit about BBCAT. And next slide, please. Um, a little bit too about our agency, the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center is based here in the Big Bend of Florida. We have um, a jurisdiction, if you will, where we provide direct case management services within six counties and right around Leon County, our capital city and our uh, of Tallahassee and our county. We do um, outreach into our rural areas as well. Um, and do a ton of training. One of the things I think I'd, I'd be remiss without if I didn't mention this, but here at Stack, we have seen a, an essential tripling of our cases of, of human trafficking, of survivors of both uh, labor and sex trafficking that we've been supporting since, since the pandemic started. So that's, that's been in one of the things that we've, um, we've experienced. Maybe you have as well in your areas. And so, um, so we do that work here locally, but as you can tell by the number of people who are logging in everywhere from, it looks like Pensacola to Ohio, Warren, Ohio, hi, um, that we do lots of work um, and our reach thankfully goes a long way with this information. We have lots on our website. So I wanted to share with you our, our web address, which I'll do later. And it's something for you to keep handy for um, anything. We've got tons of resources. That includes, by the way, this program is being recorded and we'll be posting it probably in about three weeks up on our website. And you can also see all the other programs that um, BabyCat and Stack have put on for the last year or so. These are programs that range from expungement and lots of legal issues to human trafficking and the healthcare system, which is a CEU approved program, by the way, um, to um, you know, many other topics like this one. We did one recently on the financial system so um, and how the financial sector has a role to play. So know that we've got lots of information there available for you. Here's an example of some of our outreach materials that we developed really with um, the help of Leon Cares money. This is money that came to our, our um, local community, um, our county, to help us all cope with the pandemic. And one of the things that we found, again, is not only has our caseload increased, but we have seen, of course, increased vulnerability in our community of people who were already maybe on the on the edge, you know, maybe economically insecure or having a job that that was not, uh, you know, sustained during the beginning of the pandemic, especially. 
So this is some example of, of our work here in the community. Now, I have the great honor of introducing our panel today. And for those of you who have been with us before, this is gonna be a little bit of a different program. Um, we're not gonna have a PowerPoint, we're gonna have a video, and we're gonna have a discussion about really how does it take a village um, to address human trafficking? And that sounded kind of awkward, but, but really, I always say this and you know it, it's, it's, it does take a village to address this issue. Whether you're talking um, about the village being providing direct services for survivors, whether you're talking about how does the village get together to hold perpetrators of this crime, traffickers accountable, that could be how, to, how does the financial sector get involved? How does it uh, work with the criminal justice system? It might be, how do we uh, build and fortify our community so that people are not vulnerable in, you know, economically to traffickers? That means, how do we make sure we've got a living wage and affordable housing so that, that the, um, the, the, the trouble that people are experiencing right now in terms of even keeping a roof over their head is not something that a trafficker would come in and take advantage of. Um, and how do we, you know, form that village that prevents human trafficking from ever taking place, whether you're talking about a labor trafficking situation where you might have uh, people doing, doing work in our, our farm worker uh, world or in hotels and other jobs, or whether you're talking about children who might run away from home in an abusive situation, is how do we make sure our communities are protecting those who are vulnerable so that they're not easy prey for a trafficker to lure into a situation that they that the, the victims cannot then get out of. So that's the sort of overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So let me start out by introducing our panel to you and then we'll open it up and get it going. So Justin Barfield is the Capital City Youth Services Outreach and Development Director. He has over 20 years of vocational ministry experience planning churches and launching nonprofits. Justin often finds himself assisting individuals experiencing both hope and homelessness and intersection where human trafficking thrives. Justin and his wife, Stephanie, have three beautiful children, Winifred, Olivia, and Margaret. And one is very young, I know, Justin, so I know you're a proud new papa as well. We also have with us today Sheriff Walt McNeil. He was elected Sheriff of Leon County in November, 2016. In his distinguished 40 year career as a public service servant, Sheriff McNeil has led the fight against crime in Tallahassee and has been tapped to lead two state agencies under former governor Charlie Crist, has also advised the Obama White House and other govern governments around the globe on law enforcement strategies and tactics. For 10 years at the helm of Tallahassee Police Department, which I will say that is exactly at that time, um, I want to always call you chief, but Sheriff, we, we had the opportunity to work together. Um, then Sheriff uh, Chief McNeil was recognized for his progressive voice and his effective response to citizen concerns. His community policing efforts to control gangs, drugs, and juvenile crime earned him numerous honors, including the, N the Tallahassee NAACP Humanitarian Award, Public Sector Business Person of the Year, and United States DEA Award. Um, you should also know that uh, Sheriff McNeil was past president of the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and has traveled extensively around the globe to discuss ways to combat terrorism, human trafficking, cyber crimes, and other 21st century concerns that impact global security and stability. Graciela Marquina is our um, STAX Community Services Director. She's been assisting survivors of human trafficking since 2011. Um, she is a skilled researcher and interviewer and has extensive experience in nonprofit agencies. She provides training and education on human trafficking to communities around the state and the globe, including both NGOs and governmental agencies. And Graciela will be speaking you, to you today about her work as STAX Community Services Advocate and what she does here with STAC. And it is a, a joy to work with you all the time, Graciela. Heidi Otway is the president and partner at Salter, Salter Mitchell PR and former chair of the Greater Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce. Decades of experience have solidified Heidi as an expert in all aspects of media, communications, marketing, and audience engagement. And I can tell you, we are especially honored to have 
Heidi with us today as, as her firm, Salter Mitchell, has been um, instrumental in helping Stack to, uh, with greater awareness in our Imagine Freedom um, events, with our, which have been going on for the last three days, and really helping raise the um, raise the level of expertise and understanding about human trafficking in our community. Um, Heidi has led numerous public relations and public affairs initiatives, managed the reputation of top corporations and developed campaigns targeting diverse stakeholders across Florida. By the way, the graphic you saw earlier too, that was produced um, by Salter Mitchell for Stack. For every client and cause, she relentlessly pursues results that can help them win. Her work has garnered, has supported clients in top industries and sectors. She is accredited by numerous associations, Universal Accreditation Board for Public Relations, and is a certified public relations counselor. Um, many award-winning campaigns um, have been headed by um, Heidi, and we're so grateful um, for her to be part of our, our work at STAC. Um, but also her presence in the community. Um, Nick Quinton is the Director of Discipleship and Adult Ministry at Trinity United Methodist Church. Um, he is, his work with Trinity is in support of adult religious education and organizing local, the local church for mercy and justice in the community. Nick holds a PhD in geography from FSU, Florida State University, where he maintains teaching faculty status. His academic research and teaching career focuses on social movements, electoral politics, and redistricting. He also has a background in campaign work and was an active operative between 2012 and 2020. Nick joins us today as one of the conveners of Shared Grace, which is a biweekly gathering of faith and community groups and human service providers who collaborate to improve the lives of others with care and support for one another. And um, as you can see, we tried to put together um, a small sampling of the village that is necessary to address human trafficking in community. And thank you to all of you for being with us today. I've got a six minute video for you, everyone. Um, and I love this video because it shows us really the basics of human trafficking. And I think you'll find it's also very important because you hear the voices of survivors. I think one of the things about that video is it points out many things. I hope you noticed in the beginning when they were uh, showing part of the backgrounds, you saw very rural areas like we have right around our own community here. You saw busy um, urban areas. Um, clearly you saw children and adults, uh, US citizens, uh, foreign born individuals. You saw um, very young and older people from many different walks. And so I think it does a great job of showing not just um, the range of people who could be trafficked, but also highlighted how everyone has a role and how impossible it literally is for one agency to meet all the needs of a survivor. Um, so uh, again, moving on this theme of it takes a village, I'd like to really start our discussion by, by asking our panelists to, to come on um, with their video so we can start to have our conversation and talk a little bit about their own perspective and i'm hoping you know as we go through this you'll be able to see and identify with the people who are on our panel today so let's start out with heidi otway and heidi if you could talk a little bit about your perspective and you know why you think it takes a village yeah um good afternoon everyone um i did not know that this was happening in our community until I started developing a friendship and relationship with Robin. And when she, as I started learning more about it and the brevity of it, it made me think back to an experience I had when I was chair of the Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce. And I think I was still in the chair elect position and had not yet actually moved into the position when I was approached by a business owner here in Tallahassee who said, hey, Heidi, I don't know who else to talk to, but I think that there's some kind of trafficking situation going on in the shopping plaza, you know, where my business is. And my eyes got the size of marbles. And in my brain, I'm like, 
that can't be happening in Tallahassee, Florida. You know, we're not Miami, we're not Orlando, we're not a big city. And he started giving me examples of why he believed this was happening. So of course I bring it to the attention of other chamber leaders and they too were in the same vein of myself, like that can't be happening in Tallahassee. So we did follow up with him and, and advise him to go to law enforcement. And then a couple, you know, and, and I don't really know what happened. I, I didn't hear back from him, but, you know, I said, this is something that needs to be brought up to law enforcement. And then I meet Robin and learn that it is actually happening in Tallahassee and the depth of it that is happening in our community. And, and just, I was just floored by it. And so we got involved with Stack. Um, as an agency to help them uh, create new messaging and images and materials to kind of educate the public that this was indeed happening in our community and here are the signs of what it looks like. And I'll never forget um, an experience I had where when I became aware of what was happening that I saw some engagements between men and women in our community. And I paused and I said, am I seeing trafficking right now in this situation? I, I, I mean, I became more observant and knowing, okay, and I'm staring and watching, you know, what's happening. And so that awareness has prompted our agency to become aware as a, as a, a you know, as a business in Tallahassee. And for this 20, 21 year, we actually made Stack our cause because we believe in helping good causes win. And we've donated all of our time pro bono to help raise awareness of this issue in our community. And as a member of the Tallahassee Chamber, I even um, brought this forward to the advocacy committee, uh, this issue, the members of the of the group in the room, they did not know that this is one of the, you know, this fastest growing criminal enterprise was happening in our community and the location of it. And we advocated on behalf of STAC with our county commission to get funding for a new program that's going to teach other businesses in the community how to spot these kinds of practices in our community. So, you know, this little part that we're doing hopefully is going to spread across the community because the more that people are aware, the more we can see this, this practice, you know, be brought to light and ended in our community. So I'm thrilled to be here today to talk with you about uh, what we've learned and what we've been doing and what we hope to accomplish uh, in this community. Great, thank you, Heidi. And really, on so many levels, what you just talked about, as you know, as as a, as as a resident of the community, as a leader, you know, as a businesswoman, as somebody who is is engaged all the time, um, you know, your your experience is invaluable. And also, um, uh, just when people uh, heard me, you know, read your letter to the county commission, they were like, "Oh, Heidi's Heidi's behind this." So this is, was a big plus. So thank you for all you do. In our community, yeah, um, all right. Just real quickly, you yeah. know, thank the advocacy committee because they too also sent in letters of support. So, you know, I just felt really proud in this moment that you know the business community did step up. The influencers in our business community stepped up. It's so important too because as a nonprofit, you know how it is. It's it's a it's a very difficult out there to get funding, and and we're so grateful mm -hmm. um, to you and Salter Mitchell. Um, thank you. And, and moving um, through our panel, Graciela, I'd um, like to ask you to talk a little bit from your perspective as a community services advocate and what you do with Stack as a case manager. Maybe you could fill us in a little bit on, on what you do, what case management is in case people don't know, and, and the yeah. kind of village you work with all the time. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, my name is, uh, my complete name is Graciela Sofia Marquina Ramirez. That's my whole name. I am uh, a case manager. And what I do is talk to the people and we try to create a plan. And I'm going to put some examples of, uh, of uh, cases that I have handled. None of them are, they are uh, 
I am not uh, identifying any any victims or any survivors, but I'll just put like examples with different things for you to know what, what I do. Well, first of all, uh, I come and talk to the person and I, in my trainings, I always said, get the biases that you have out of the door and the privileges that you have out of the door. I need to talk to the person knowing, being conscious that I can hear, I can, I can see, I speak two languages, I have two hands and I can walk. And I don't, I don't uh, ex um, expect that from the person. I don't want to have any biases. Um, I explain who I am. Uh, most of the time people uh, believe that I'm coming from uh, whatever they, they are, uh, probably I am coming from law enforcement or I am part of the government or I am DCF worker. Uh, and, and I explain who I am and I keep reiterating that because um, that's important that they, they understand what am I doing. Um, and so I listen to what the person has to say and, uh, and then um, I ask some questions to see what are the needs, immediate needs and long-term needs of this person. Um, and between both of us, we, we prioritize what it can be done now and when, when it can be done later, has to be done later. And we always, or at the, you know, in, in the organization always uh, put safety. So safety plan is going to be immediately, uh, as we speak, we're going to, I am going to start talking about how to be safe for the situation that this person is going to have. And, and like in the video, all situations are very different. So I'm going to put one example, for example, um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, a social worker from the hospital calls me and, and she has uh, a person there that um, is uh, a survivor or, or victim of human trafficking. So I talk to the, the person and uh, this person, for example, needs a hotel. So I have to have a good relationship with a hotel uh, to kind of arrange that. Um, probably this person needs uh, grief and loss, um, brief bereavement. Uh, somebody, this person probably lost somebody recently and needs counseling on that. Probably this person, so I need to contact people. I need to contact either FSU or other organizations. Uh, I need to know if this person might qualify for food stamps. If, this person is already receiving it. This person might need a mechanic. So I will go around the community with possibly Nick or, you know, like who knows a good mechanic that can give us some break. Uh, another example, it could be somebody that is an immigrant and um, uh, this person might not know Spanish or English is, uh, you know, um, dialect that they, they, they speak in their native language. Just really hard. It is really hard to communicate. Um, so I start talking about who am I again? Uh, what is this culture? The, the very basic things about usually people, <laughs> there's so many details about coming to another country and not understanding why people are not eating at three o'clock PM. You know, that's, that's the way that everyone eats. No, um, you know, this culture has this schedules and um, it, probably this person doesn't know how to use a microwave. Uh, probably this person is living already in a house that they don't know how to live in a microwave. I have met people that have never been in an elevator. Uh, so, you know, that does go in also some life skills that I am talking with that person. Very likely this person will need the help of an attorney. So I will call either Vanya or North Florida Legal Services. Um, probably this person we can help with, for example, a Walmart gift card. So I bring the gift card and they don't know what is a gift card. This, they haven't ever used a, a credit card, for example. So all those things are uh, going along with 
safety, uh, trying to establish rapport with a person um, and, and see what else we can do. Hopefully long-term would be uh, start getting English classes, um, you know, what is the situation with work and, and uh, socially, if they can participate in a soccer game with the other people that are coming from Quincy, you know, is, is another example. Okay, so the, the, I have another example because this happened already twice. Um, so for example, we have a survivor that uh, just needs a bus ticket to go to whatever they need to do. Um, we already talk about safety, we already know, and that's what this person needs to do. I, I don't put the priorities, I don't tell them what to do, I follow what they want, I'm listening and I'm follow what they, following what, what they, they want. However, this person has a dog, and this dog needs to be, uh, you know, has to go to uh, vaccines and have to have the record or whatever. So we call North Florida Animal Hospital uh, to see if they can help us, which they have. Uh, and uh, then I go with the community and trying to find out if there's any um, a dog carrier that I can get for this person. Uh, the other thing that, that, that uh, another example is, um, for example, uh, there is a, a law enforcement has called us and, uh, and then there is this, this, this person that might need help. So I wanted to talk to the uh, law enforcement uh, victim advocate and see what they have done and, and then you know, just not to repeat the same things that I, that I do. Um, then we can probably help with rent assistance. Of course, safety goes all the time. Uh, possibly I need to talk to Vanya again, the Human Rights Center. Um, very likely I will be talking with Justin and because there is probably a, a, a problem with a, or an issue with a, with a young person. Uh, and very likely I will try to reach at least the, the social worker at the school. Um, the, I have done, I have worked with uh, tribes. Uh, I have to reach out and say, I have this person here. Uh, what can you, how can you help us? Then I learned that, <laughs> um, that I need to call exactly the tribe, not a tribe. Um, and um, I have, uh, have a single thing here. Okay. There's so many. Yeah, well, well t t just a few things more. Um, we have to have a good relationship with a Mexican consulate in Orlando and other consulates. Um, uh, I have personally myself reached out to the American embassy in Mexico, trying to help a, a client. Uh, we have to have, of course, we work all the time with Carney Center, the dentist psychology department, autism and FSU, Department of Health. We need vac vaccines. We need uh, social worker, of course, medical schools, faith-based community. Nick, thank you so much for the meetings. I, I have even been with our clients in a bank teller in explaining the whole situation. So uh, probably I was really detailed in, in some things, but, uh, but that's kind of how it goes. And, and, that's, so and that's the village. And the thing is, um, as you've done your work and what we've seen surely is that, um, that your village is around support for the survivor immediately. I couldn't do yeah. any otherwise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no other way. And um, from whether it's a vet or, uh, you know, as you said, so, so thank you for that. And I think we'll probably doing be doing follow up. And, and I think you may have also inspired people to understand that on their local coalitions, everyone that you mentioned is somebody who could be welcome and be working together um, on that. Um, I'd like to next uh, move to Justin and also talk to you, Justin, because you know, your village is one that's focused on youth and you've been doing this work for quite some time. Um, and again, we're looking at about, you know, everyone is taking about seven minutes or so to just introduce their um, their world, their village. Well, thank you, Robin. And thank you everybody for letting us have a few moments of your day. Um, I've listened to uh, Heidi and Gaciela speak and there are a couple of moments in both of their presentations that really, um, 
uh, were pronounced for me. Uh, it was uh, the personal or firsthand experience of Heidi kind of being shocked and awe to learn some of this information. Also, Graciela, some of the items that you shared uh, just a moment ago were even new and it's new information to me now. And so um, uh, I'm there's a bit of a kind of a you have to kind of step back and soak it in. The video is wonderful. Um, I think it takes a village, um, first of all, because we, we need to recognize that this is our village. It takes a village because it is our village, uh, our members, our neighbors who are trafficked. Uh, it is our village. These are our neighbors who are being trafficked uh, and, the, and the neighbors who are doing the trafficking. Uh, I think immediately of, uh, if we haven't touched on it, I missed it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sure others will. Uh, uh, Stolen Innocence, the uh, dragnet that was uh, in operation back in 2020, I think it was November, where they announced it had been going on for a couple of years. In Tallahassee, 170 people were arrested. Um, I, I want to read a little bit from uh, that release. According to past reporting by the Tallahassee Democrats, the Johns, and others swept up in the investigation include a PE teacher and a write-in candidate. Others arrested include university and state employees and individuals with criminal records. Um, so these are, these are our neighbors. This is our village. And, and that just kind of sums up the, our time here. Um, but in the video, they used the term freedom of choice, and that really resounded with me, impacted me, because uh, it reminds me of the response I hear often when I ask uh, people about experience um, uh, with others who are experiencing homelessness. I hear often, oh, those people want to be homeless. They're choosing homelessness. Well, no, no, I, I heartily disagree with that, as most of us do. Um, it's just simply that they're not aware of their options. Um, people experiencing homelessness, people who are um, uh, wrapped up in trafficking behavior activities or victims or survivors, however we put it, uh, often don't know that they have options. They're not aware of the options they have, or quite simply and frankly, uh, they don't have the options that some of us on this panel have had. Um, and so they're, they're making choices every day. Um, that's where CCYS comes uh, into play, uh, Capital City Youth Services. We've been around um, for over 45 years, I think, originally under the YMCA, we operated our Someplace Else Emergency Shelter. That is uh, where we serve youth ages 10 to 17, give them um, a safe place to stay, 24-hour supervision. Uh, we give access to counseling for both the youth and their family. Uh, we also operate a non-residential counseling service called Family Place, where uh, we serve uh, six to 17 year olds and their families. These are free of charge services with no impact on uh, uh, insurance or, or pay. Um, those are not prerequisites, either one of those. Uh, we also have early intervention program called Stop Now and Plan that serves six through 11 and uh, through family focused intervention programs. Uh, and I've been working very closely for the past several months for us, uh, with our street outreach program called Going Places. Uh, street outreach uh, places, I'm sorry, street outreach program, Going Places, operates a mobile street outreach effort as well as a drop-in center. Um, this is where we see many, many individuals uh, who are caught up with um, the human trafficking experience, particularly sex trafficking. Um, you can read more about the rest of our services on, on ccys.org. Uh, I also wanna make sure that I announce that our uh, group home treehouse has officially shifted uh, to focus exclusively on uh, youth uh, who are at risk for sex trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. Uh, it's, it's, it's all over, it's all over our place all over our, our town, across eight counties with the Big Ben. And I'm reminded of um, the last thing that one of our uh, clients at Going Places said to me uh, as she uh, 
was was telling us that she doesn't need our services anymore that she would figure it out because um it has to do with the impact of affordable housing in our area um i, I have witnessed uh, the struggles of of the youth and when i say youth i mean uh, transitional age youth between the ages of 16 and 24 the, that's the range that going places actually really serves and focuses on and i'm watching the chat as things come in uh, but the last thing this individual said to me and we'll call her shade she said i know what i'm good at the last thing i heard from her and we've tried to re-engage this individual um, for many many months this individual was working with going places um, she had grown up experiencing chronic homelessness she'd been served by multiple agencies in our town harney center um, DCYS, um, several others, Big Ben Homeless Coalition, you know, the regulars. Uh, we had gotten her um, out of uh, a hotel stay um, that Carney Center was providing. We got her employed. We helped uh, Career Source help get her a job. She was doing really, really well. She got plugged into the Rapid Rehousing Program, uh, which helps uh, vulnerable individuals, both youth and adults, uh, gain access to housing. Oftentimes, rapid rehousing dollars will pay for the deposit, first three months rent. Sometimes some programs will pay up to 12 months rent. Um, this individual um, really wanted to do things on their own. They secured a lease. We got some rapid rehousing dollars uh, because of the lack of credit history and the lack of established uh, rental history. Uh, she was charged out the wazoo which is uh, typical these days, multiple months rent up front. Um, they spent down the money quickly uh, and she, she ran out of money. Shade ran out of money, um, she, but she, she wanted an easy way out and uh, she wanted to do things on her own. And then the last conversation we had with her, which I hope is not the last, but it's the most recent conversation I've had with her months ago. She said, never mind, I don't need your help anymore. I'm gonna go back to prostitution because that's what I'm good at. And this, this individual grew up witnessing acceptable behavior in her village. As a child, she saw how easy it was to get money. So she slipped into this behavior as a child as a minor youth. She learned this behavior and still carries it to this day as an acceptable form of making ends meet. Now she's an adult. She's participating in prostit prostitution. If she was a minor, it would be trafficking. Uh, this is not something that uh, just happens. This isn't a switch that gets flipped. This is a long, continuum of learned behavior. I won't say learned, but I like the term acceptable behavior because if the village turns a blind eye, if the village allows something to continue, if the village, if the family allows certain behaviors um, to continue, an individual thinks that they only have one option. And so at PCYS, again, I just wanna wrap up my few minutes here. Uh, our work is to help youth and families find the inner resiliency that they already have and tap into that so that they can identify, access, and pursue the world of options that they have for them. It's about filling up their lives with hope. Thank you, Justin. And thank you for talking about Shade and, and what she went through in terms of this really long-term, you know, telescoped back to childhood and then going forward. I think it's important. Sometimes, you know, when people think about human trafficking, they only think about that moment of getting someone, identifying them as being trafficked and then and then getting out of that situation and then our work is done. And, and without a sense of how layered this issue is, how complex it is, how much, you know, it's like peeling away an onion off and um, sometimes the trauma is so deep that it, it can take years, obviously, to to work through it. So um, so thank you for that nuanced and at the same time, again, concerning and and really troubling idea that, you know, there's there is a lot that we can that we need to do.
um, and that the system sometimes um, does not do what it needs to do to support these individuals. Um, I'd like to move now to Sheriff McNeil. Um, Sheriff, you know, you've, you've been there um, doing so much of uh, training and, uh, and uh, you know, work within your department and, and um, we've worked together as a service provider with you all and are grateful for that. What are some of your perspectives? And I think about your all in campaign um, or, you know, I don't know that it's a campaign. What would you call it? A mission of, of work. So, um, so Sheriff would love to hear from you. Well, uh, thank you, Robin. And, and thank you uh, to uh, Survive and Thrive and to the uh, Big Ben Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And also those of you who are on this panel uh, this afternoon, I, uh, and Justin, really appreciate your, uh, your thoughtfulness and looking at the village in the, in the way that you do. But it, it really is uh, all of our problem. And that quite honestly becomes part of the problem that everybody does not get it. It's like the uh, epiphany that uh, Heidi had when she saw it raw in its raw form. Uh, unfortunately, it, it almost seems as though it, it takes that kind of uh, a rawness to get us engaged in this kind of uh, effort to deal with this, this crime or these continuous problems in our community. I will tell you that uh, obviously here in the Big Bend, uh, universities, uh, two universities here, a junior college, uh, we have a major uh, highway uh, right through our city. And we are a transitional kind of community we don't think of ourselves as that, but we have a lot of transitional people that come through and it makes us a, an easy uh, target, if you will, for trafficking. The fact that we are a, I, I like to call it a semi-rural uh, community. Uh, we are a metropolitan community that has all this rural stuff around us. And uh, so there are people out there trying to take advantage of what they see are an area that's ripe for the picking, if you will. So what we tried to do, quite honestly, and Robin talked about it, uh, with our all in, uh, it is our way in law enforcement of saying it takes a village to really deal with these issues. It takes all of us with an understanding that what's happening isn't being done in isolation, that it's impacting all of us. Some of us just don't see it as, as openly as others do. And, and quite honestly, I have to talk about this, the fact that we in law enforcement have not always been as equipped as we should be to deal with these, these issues and problems that we have. Uh, I, I look at the protocols that we have in place in terms of how we do interviews of, of uh, persons who've been uh, trafficked. I mean, we, we now talk about in our protocol that we don't go up to the person during the interview and ask them, are you a slave? Have you been... Uh, the uh, I mean, it starts the discussion off in the wrong direction. It's those minor things that make a big difference in the way we are successful or, or, or lack of being successful as we try to deal with these issues. One of the problems, again, that we have is, is trying to make sure that uh, oftentimes, uh, like uh, Graciela was talking about, we have people in our community that don't speak this language. This isn't their first language. And we have difficulties communicating. We don't do enough in law enforcement, quite honestly, to make sure that we've got linguists uh, throughout that we have access to that can get us to, and that's why I love uh, uh, Survive and Thrive, because that's those are the resources we're now trying to tap into. We've not done as well a, a, a job of that in the past as we should, and we're working on trying to make sure that happens. The, uh, the fact that uh, we have, Quincy, Florida, uh, it's a, a, a migrant community uh, right next to us. We, we've seen the, uh, the massage parlors that are popping up uh, all across uh, Leon County. And we know in those circumstances, we in law enforcement, as soon as one of those op things open up from, and I can tell you, this is one of our goals going forward. Anytime we have a massage parlor open, if we have a, one of those industries that, that caters to, quite honestly, low paying jobs uh, that creates and allows the environment where people can in fact be uh, in, in slave labor or in, in sex labor, 
Uh, we are now going to focus on going to those businesses and having a discussion. And that's what we should be doing, proactively engaging those businesses, not pointing a finger at them, just simply trying to have that dialogue about here are the realities of the circumstances. When you've got, for example, if you've got a lawn service in our community and you've got uh, people coming in and don't speak the language, uh, we need to sit down with those businesses and talk about how can we help you and how can you help us as it relates to making sure that we don't have people being victimized in our community. This quite honestly, when I look at the total crime that takes place in Tallahassee, I believe that uh, we have not measured the uh, trafficking component of crime in the way it should be. I believe it has tentacles that stretch into so many other areas. I think uh, Robin talked about our banking industry. I will tell you we're remiss in that regard in law enforcement. We are not uh, doing what we should be in terms of making contact with the banks and talking about uh, how money is laundered through them and how these persons are taking their monies that are gained through this process. So I, I believe if we can start having uh, the village discussion, and I'm, I'm happy, Heidi, when you talked about the chamber becoming engaged, I think with the growth that we're seeing in Tallahassee with Amazon coming to our community, I mean, we already know that Amazon is going to attract people coming in. There are other industries that are coming up. The way we deal with these problems, and, and, I, and the folks out there from other communities around the country, the way we deal with these problems is to get ahead of the issues and stop trying to fight those issues from the back. And the way we do that is to have those discussions up front with our businesses. And that's what I, I will tell you and I announce today on, on, on this, because I've been shamed into it, quite honestly. Uh, we had a sex trafficking situation happen this week. I had my staff give Robin uh, a call and we got their assistance. But we don't have a, tra a sex trafficking uh, unit in the sheriff's office. And we didn't have it yesterday. Today it's being stood up. Uh, specifically, specifically because we are not doing enough. Uh, and I've known about these issues for quite some time, quite honestly. But I when I looked at it, I thought to our staff and I asked, okay, who's the investigator assigned to this? Well, uh, there's something to be said about having the responsibility and the name responsibility for it. Most of the time we said that's a person's crime. So we have a person's crime unit that is assigned to deal with all person's crimes. Well, that's all crimes, but who's specifically assigned to deal with sex trafficking or human trafficking? Well, well, nobody. And so we, we corrected that yesterday. There is someone now assigned to it so we can specifically deal with it. And that's what we've got to do, I think, all across our country to make sure that we've got people specifically engaged in this hideous uh, criminal enterprise so we can wrestle it to the ground. And uh, again, I want to just thank uh, uh, you all, uh, Robin, for all the work you do and for uh, making people like me get off my duff and do my job. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Sheriff, um, it, thank you, and thank you for taking that step. Um, you know, I, I also love the way you talked about this being a kind of a metropolitan area and semi-rural, and and we look forward to working with you and your deputies and your investigators and your advocates and continuing really what we've already established. You've you are, I think, one of the only agencies. By the way, don't. I, I, you know, this is a huge step, no question. Um, but I remember when we were training your road patrol officer several years ago and doing that 5 a.m. shift change. So you've been uh, you've been in the trenches on this issue. So I appreciate that uh, so much, uh, Sheriff. And and we also hope too in our community. I don't know how everyone else um, experiences this, but we have not had a labor trafficking prosecution in our area either. And we know, again, it's a crime of crimes, right? So we know that there are many crimes that these labor traffickers are also committing and look forward to um, identifying that. Um, so thank you for your all your, your leadership, your collaboration in this great step forward, uh, for sure. And now, um, last but not least, uh, Nick, we'd like you to talk a little bit about the faith community and some of your thoughts on the village of the faith community, really an ecumenical response often because traffickers don't don't care what faith someone is or is not attached to. Um, everybody has a role um, with our uh, all of members of faith community. So um, and and the faith community has been vital. Um, there's no question that across the country, 
um, people of all denominations have stepped forward uh, to address the issue of trafficking. So talk a little bit about, um, about your thoughts. And as you're talking too, I'd really like to ask um, everyone too to, to do some reflecting on any of the things you've heard so far from our panelists and as you listen to Nick. Um, and if you have any questions for the panel, we wanna pick those up right after he's done. So Nick. Yeah, Robert, Pastor thank, Nick. You. thank you for having me. Um, you know, in my tradition, we don't have a choice on this. I, I work at a at a in a United Methodist Church. We're uh, unabashedly Christian, and uh, we don't have a choice but to step into this space. If there's one thing that's true in the witness of Scripture in our tradition, it's that it's that we've got to respond to those that are vulnerable in society, and we've got we've got to work alongside with compassion and care and grace to do something in their lives and in the broader community. Uh, and I know that's true for my for my family and my brothers and sisters that are that are Muslim and that I, are Jewish, right? I know it's across the board as we all kind of carry that love and care out to the world. And and I'll tell you all a story. Um, in and I met Robin and Graciela, the team at Stack, at the beginning of the pandemic when we started working together and shared grace. Uh, just hearing the needs of the human services folks and. And, and, and faith leaders and communities trying to answer those needs. And one of the things that came out and Robin and Graciela kept telling us, we will come and do a training with your team. We will come and do a training with your team. We did that Trinity in February. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but in February we had a training with staff. It was a lunch and learn about an hour and a half. And, and I'm telling y'all, it makes all the difference. We are a downtown church. We are right up the road from the bus stop. Uh, there are lots of folks in and around downtown, just in general, uh, folks that are unsheltered and experiencing homelessness and other folks pass through. We're a point of contact for an awful lot of people. And, and it's interesting, uh, probably two months ago, one of our staff members went to the hospital to do a visit, to, to check on a member that was having surgery. It's COVID, so they had to wait outside. And while they're waiting, uh, a young woman walks up to the staff member and, and asks for help. And the staff member begins to dialogue with her. And, and out of this conversation comes a connection between this person and staff. That's so our staff member had, the, had the, the awareness to connect this person to staff. They suspected that this young woman might be trafficked at that moment, might be a victim in the midst and reached out and connected the staff. And, and in our staff meeting the following Tuesday, the staff member got up and said, look, I, I wouldn't have known if we hadn't done that training. I wouldn't have known how to, how to, how to answer the questions. We heard the sheriff say, we've gotta be careful how we, how we engage with folks that we suspect may be trafficked at that moment. You can't just come right out and ask it. Right? That's a different conversation. Uh, you know, to approach people in, in their trauma, we heard fear in the video, to, to come at folks and meet them where they are, that's what we're called to do. And, and when we meet people where they are, sometimes we're going to find them as victims of trafficking in the moment. We might find them as survivors who are living their lives after the fact, and we've got to engage them on their terms as best we can. And we also need to, and we also need to understand, and y'all, I cannot express this enough, the role of the faith community is to understand our role in this is not to try to be the savior, not to try to rescue somebody. That is wrong. Our role is to meet them where they are and understand that we can get them in touch with professionals who are trained to do this. You heard Graciela share all the things that she does to work with somebody, y'all. I can't, I don't have, I don't know how many, Gracie, I don't know how many hours you have in your week, but you got more than me. That's what I heard, right? I don't, I don't know, you, you must be working with way more hours in a week than I am, because I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing, I, I don't know. Anyway, like we're, we've got to get, we've got to understand how to engage and get people where they need to be and, and, and not feel like we've got to do that on our own. And I, you know, yes, walking with people, supporting them, caring, loving on them, you know, a grace-filled approach is important, but, but also understanding that, that we're, you know, that we can do more damage than good. We can do harm. And, you know, as Methodists, do no harm. That's up, that's, that's up at the top for us. And, and we've got to be careful. 
and how we do this. And so training, awareness, Heidi, you talked about this at length is raising the awareness in our community, right? how important it is for us to know where to turn, where to go, and, and what to do in that situation. And y'all, in the faith community, that's our work. Like, that's our work. It's to spend time with our friends at Stack, to spend time with our friends at the IRC, to spend time with our friends at CCYS and at Kearney, to chat with the sheriff's office. You're our friend too, Sheriff. Right? We can spend time with our friends there too and, and really listen and see where we can fill in the gap. You know, a, a very wise woman, a, a, I'd call her a prophet, she, she blushed me saying it, once told me that, that she finds God between us, is that God's grace is between us. And y'all, that's our work, is to fill in, in the faith community, fill in between everybody else and make sure that we are making the vital connections that need to be made. And understanding our role in that is to usher folks with grace and care to the help that they need. And that's our, that's our responsibility. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. And, and I think that's right on. In fact, you've just inspired one of the people asking a question here, which is, are you available to do training um, to other groups? So, um, <laughs> so, um, so we can get you, uh, we can get you the email address for this person and, and see if you are, are you? We could, I, I, maybe, I don't know, we could chat. <laughs> yeah. We need to find more hours. We need to find more hours, Nick. I, I got to talk to somebody about how to get more hours out of my week. So, and, and you know what, you, everybody's raised the, the, this issue and talked about um, how it does, um, how we've all got a role to play and that our, our, our villages are configured in a bunch of different ways. So let me open it up in terms of other questions from uh, those of you who are attending, um, feel free to chat in a question. And um, somebody asked, do you work with schools to train educators on how to recognize the signs of trafficking and respond? And, and uh, yes, we do and we have. Um, the Department of Education has also just hired someone new to do some of that within the Department of Ed. A couple of years ago, they passed a rule that requires all schools in Florida to have an, a plan on how they are going to train students and um, staff and bus drivers and, and everyone connected with a school around human trafficking, K to 12. Um, so that is something where accountability on that issue is found uh, by you talking to your local school board. So so I, I encourage everyone who's on this call, if you're in Florida, to call your local school board and ask to see their implementation plan. I'll tell you, we tried to do that here in the um, in our area in the second judicial circuit, and it was really hard. Um, not everyone has done it. Sometimes it's hard to find it. Sometimes you can't find it. So uh, I think really picking up the ball on that would be a great one um, for all of you and do some of that grassroots advocacy. Um, but there are the kind of mechanisms in place to accomplish that. Um, before I open it up too, to our panel again, if you all wanna unmute yourselves, we're gonna have some conversation, but I'm gonna put on, uh, on the chat our, our uh, website and also the website for the National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's really important for you to um, know that the national hotline is out there. Uh, there's a, a phone number, 888-3737-888, as well as um, a text to 33733 for people to reach out 24-7. It's a multi-lingual uh, resource, and, it, and STAC is a referral agency to that hotline, too. So if, you're, if you call them, we get calls quite often from the hotline with people here needing help. So I want to make sure everybody's got those two resources before opening it up. Um, somebody's asking if we're active on college campuses and educating higher education students on what human trafficking looks like. Um, we want to be more active. Um, one of the great, great um, assets to our area in our state is um, the FSU Center for the Advancement of Human Rights. Lots and lots of great work comes out of there with Terry Coonan and um, Vanya Aguilar, who work tirelessly, both advocating as well as representing uh, immigrant victims, not just of trafficking, but other crimes. Um, so we, there's lots of good education and it's really, I, it's like with the law or with medicine or anything, I challenge anyone to tell me an area of higher education that doesn't need to know about human trafficking, sex and labor trafficking, right? So, um, so we're doing our best, Ryan, and it's good to see you with us. 
Um, so let me open it up. Anybody got any thoughts or, um, or questions of, of one another, first of all, before we get into any more specific questions and any reactions? You know, I'm, I'm wondering about, about uh, the, the work that the sheriff's office has just started. I mean, it explicitly started with yesterday or today. I mean, um, uh, is there, and, and, and it's probably too early to answer, but just to know that, that, that the faith community is out there and, and intersecting with y'all and stack both is would be important for us to, to just get up and i don't know what that looks like i'm just putting it out there um that that it seems like it seems like uh you know we we keep we try to keep our staff with the information they need to contact whomever right when we meet somebody who who needs help it's like where do we where do we get the help right where do we put them? right and and that and and it sounds like that may end up being a call to y'all at some point too Right. And I want to be I want to be aware and conscientious of that. Yeah, uh, Nick, that's a great question. And I don't want to mislead you into saying we we're not working uh, human trafficking right now. We are. Yeah. My, my point here is that we do it in such a a uh, siloed way that we're going to change that now. Have somebody completely responsible for all aspects of human trafficking. Not this one individual gets a case, works that case, and then we wait for the next human trafficking case to come along. So we're going to have a unit that's specifically devoted to it so that we can start to put uh, all of the village together in these meetings that are taking place around the community. This person, those persons in that unit are now going to be responsible making sure they're keeping up with all the village parts. The other piece that we want to do, because we are the I, I want to correct what I said, we're the metropolitan area and the, what I want to say, we're the city in the forest. Leon <laughs> County is in Tallahassee, the city in the forest. And the city in the forest is the biggest city in the entire Big Bend. So there are, there are smaller agencies around us that are having the same similar situations. And we have the assets and the resources to assist them, which we aren't necessarily doing to the extent that we can today. So I hope we put stand this unit up, but we start to now we will be the driving force of trying to make sure all these law enforcement components in our region are working together, comparing cases, going back and looking at, seeing exactly how was this case work? Where's where that person today? Like we, we arrested a lady yesterday. We tried to talk to her about, we think she was being trafficked, but obviously sometimes the victims won't cooperate with us. We've got, we're trying to make sure we can get to her before she bails out and we won't see her again. So. So we're trying, and we don't have the, the systems in place right now so that we can figure out exactly where she's going, so we can follow up on where she's going, who she, who bailed her out, all that stuff we need to capture and track and keep up with. We don't do that as well as we should today. Those are the nuances we're talking about changing as it relates to how we go about investigating these cases, not just when we make the arrests and walk away from it saying, okay, we did our job. No, there's a bigger piece of this that we need to drill down on. And heretofore, we haven't done as well as we could have. So I hope that that clears it up for you a little bit, Nick. It, it was, it, you got it, right? It's the person, like the, the human right. that we contact, right? That's what matters, right? right. No, I didn't mean to imply y'all weren't doing it already. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, there's, look, there's, I mean, you're a big organization, and right? I, I don't want to throw a dart trying to figure out where to, well, you're right. It's the person now. It yep. used to be the unit. Now it's the person. Yep. Exactly. And and that's going to be so important to have that point of contact, whether you're talking about a money laundering situation that someone might um, bring to our attention or an individual in a massage establishment. So so again, that's so great. We look forward to working with you. And it, it also um, makes me want to make sure that we all talk about some of our partners. Nick, you mentioned the International Rescue Committee, and we were going to have a, a representative from the IRC on today, and he wasn't able to attend. The IRC, um, the Open Doors Outreach Network, Work um, are two places that 
also deal with human trafficking cases in, in individual ways, the Human Rights Center at Florida State as well. And we do have other agencies that we've worked really closely with and do all the time. Um, so, so what we like to, to provide a service to the community as um, a stack is to be a kind of hub to connect and to collaborate with. And, and um, yes, with the International Rescue Committee, we've worked very, very closely. In fact, they brought, a, a, you know, for the first time, a, a very, um, you know, good federal grant uh, funding into our area, which we hope will, will get renewed, and, and which resulted in really tens of thousands of dollars of support going to direct support for survivors here. So um, we, we need to keep up that kind of, of support for our work as we're going forward with the IRC. So, um, so great. Um, now we've got about 15 minutes left. And, and one of the things I always um, hope we can talk about is, is kind of the vision of when you've seen challenges um, with regard to, you know, putting a village together, responding uh, in collaboration, where have you seen this kind of model work well? Like, have, have there been instances where you might have seen something like this in the past where I think, um, Sheriff, you used the word siloed even within your own department, but um, how can we break through those silos? And have you seen that um, it, it happen, for example, in, in Tallahassee? And Heidi, it looks like you're nodding. Maybe you have some ideas on where you might've seen challenges and how they've been overcome in terms of, you know, kind of bringing people together and, and forging a collaboration. All right, I'll let the sheriff speak and then I can talk about just the whole idea of communicating about such a taboo topic. Cause I think it's something that we should be doing. So I don't know if the sheriff wanted to respond first or someone Did else. you want to say anything, Sheriff? No, go ahead, uh, Heidi. I'm, I'm all ears now. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, as a professional communicator, you know, people don't really want to talk about, you know, these kinds of challenges that they may be experiencing in their community. But it's like when you become aware of something, you can't be unaware of it anymore. And I think that's the position that I'm in, as well as my team and then others that I've communicated with about this issue. Because at first, we're all like, no, this can't be happening. But then as you start becoming more educated about the issue, then you start saying, wow, I think I'm seeing evidence of this. And, you know, the one thing that I would love to challenge and encourage everyone on this line to consider is, you know, start having conversations with people that are not in your bubble or people within your industry or others who are doing the same work as you go out and talk to your sons, your daughters, your cousins, your nephews, your aunties, your pastors, you know, the grocery store person, because if we don't start having these conversations and bringing this to light in our communities, it will be that, you know, hidden under a rock where only a handful of us are knowing about it, or we'll see it in the newspaper, but not really understand from a contextual perspective that people are talking about this issue. And I shared with Robin a couple of weeks ago, I went to dinner with some girlfriends and we were sitting outside in the restaurant and, you know, we're laughing and joking and someone said something that just triggered, this is an opportunity for me to tell them what's happening in our community. So I brought up hey, just so y'all know, our agency is working to help raise awareness of human um, and sex trafficking in our, in our community. And they all kind of looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? And so we had this dialogue where we, I said, have you ever been over to I-10 and North Monroe Street in Leon County, Tallahassee, which is where a lot of that activity takes place? And all of a sudden, someone said, I knew it. I knew it. I saw something at the KFC and just told this story about what she experienced. And so here we are having this dialogue where people are seeing things, but they don't know what to do. They don't understand what they're looking at. And so having these conversations really can help people become more aware. And awareness is not just I know. Awareness is what are you going to do once you know? And that's the key. And that's a lot of what we do in our agency is you want to make people aware, but you want to prompt action. You want to prompt change. You want to prompt behavior change. So I just challenge everyone to just start having these conversations, find that opening and talk about it. We talk about, about everything else. And you know, Heidi, one of the things that we're doing now, and we didn't talk about it too much in terms of awareness. Sometimes people go like, 
what can I do? And, and people may, maybe don't realize that as a consumer of goods and services too, you can actually look at those businesses, the farms, the, the local organizations that um, have uh, pay attention to whether or not the goods and services that they're selling or using are trafficking free. How many times um, do we have a question and, and see somebody working in a, at a mall or um, in a convenience store and you just wonder what's going on with that person? Um, you might see somebody in an environment and, and it's really incumbent, I think, and the business community is rising, I think, to the occasion so that they can be aware too, right? And be aware of their supply chain so that us as consumers like today, if you're in our area, you can go get a coffee, get a get a great latte at Red Eye Coffee because Barbie Morrow and Red Eye is absolutely um, walking the talk of being um, uh, trafficking free in the coffee beans that they grind and roast and sell and you, the coffee you drink. So um, that kind of greater uh, world vision to me helps us see how you can and you know create a, a global village, if you will, of of a place that's trafficking free, where people are getting paid a fair wage, you know, where they're not being exploited for labor or sex, and uh, and you can vote with your dollars on that. And and there's lots of um, uh, slaveryfootprint.org is a place you can go. Um, you can just Google um, slavery free food or slavery free um, uh, goods and services, and you'll get lots of good information that's out there. So I just want to make sure people knew about that as well. Yeah, Graciela. Uh, Robin, I just wanted to make sure that um, that Justin is able to address one of the questions um, in the chat uh, from uh, Melanie Wilson. Yeah, okay. uh, if, if, if this is a good time. Yeah. I can also connect off my, so I think, I think the question was uh, why the focus? Um, I'll, I'll tell you quite simply, the need, the need is there. Um, uh, children in foster care, older children in foster care, uh, displaying and uh, presenting uh, behaviors associated with uh, risk for sex trafficking um, are usually not wanted in um, foster homes where there are younger children. Um, and so what's, what I understand is happening is that some of these older youth, and we've, we've shifted the, the focus age um, range uh, of Treehouse from six to 11 to uh, 12 to 17 now, uh, these, these kids aren't getting placed. Uh, there was a mutual client recently who was in a in-between home, pseudo foster home. DCF is involved totally, you know, totally above board um, in a shared home with, um, with younger kids. And one day, this older youth, 17 years old, was bored. That, that was her response. I was bored. I didn't know what else to do. Went online, engaged a John, went out and... Uh, you know, sex acts were conducted. The John later showed up to this this care home, and now it's a now it's an inflamed scenario. Um, we don't. I believe we have a shortage of of, of um, foster homes, not group homes necessarily, uh, but um, you know, Family First Act uh, legislation is really impacting placement. Um, obviously when a family is is healthy and safe that's best place for a kid i think we just have a major shortage of of appropriate foster homes in our area and so our response as an agency is to make the space uh, to create the space to keep the space and to honor the the value and the sacredness of these of these older youth who are falling between the gaps and i'm speaking yeah specifically about treehouse um, so hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I think some other agencies in our area are making the shift as well. Um, I think Boys Town is trying to, and uh, there's another uh, agency in town that's focusing specifically on males. Um, but Treehouse is a um, multi-gender site. Um, so hopefully and that answers. And housing and um, and services for youth in that way, and housing in general, is a great need. Housing and counseling comes up all the time. Um, I also I'll wanted to Robin. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. The house, the housing issue. I can, I can tell you, and I'm trying to stand still. My CEO told me I'm moving too much, so I'll try to stay focused. The housing issue is critical. Um, I, I don't see much difference between uh, people's response. Um, uh, much difference between faith and disparity when it comes to finding safe shelter or stable housing these days. Um, our, our older youth are engaged, uh, some of them engage in labor trafficking, some of them in sex, survival sex if they're older. Um, I mean, just, just to find and keep a place. Um, it, it, is, it is very difficult to find an affordable home which HUD would constitute as 30% or less of your income. Now you do the math, if you are uh, working at a low range, a low wage job as the sheriff referenced earlier, what can you afford with no credit history? Or if you're, if you're a survivor trying to get out of sex trafficking or any form of human trafficking, what can you afford? I, I, I would challenge you to find an affordable home or an apartment um, that a 20 year old, 21 year old can, can get into. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, um, this issue, it's why sometimes when we talk to our, um, our sister agencies in town and we say, you know, someone might be focused on, on, uh, uh unhoused helping, um, the unhoused. We, I think of them doing anti-trafficking work because guess what, if we're not providing housing for an individual who doesn't have a roof over their head and they want it, the trafficker will. The trafficker will go to them and say, "We can. I'll take care of your needs. I'll take care of of, of getting uh, clothes for your kids. I'll, uh, you know, I'll do whatever you need." That's part of the seduction. So that's why you know making sure that those needs are met, however it is, right? Whether it's housing, education, healthcare, um, anything um, that is anti-trafficking and, work. And 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 Robert, uh, I, I lost. I had. To connectivity issues yesterday i think i um the uh the other presentation housing first is human trafficking prevention i believe that with all my heart and soul if somebody has a safe and stable shelter and or stable housing their 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 choice their choices have opened up we, we simply don't have enough of that in this area i'm not just talking in Tallahassee. I've, I've spoken with uh, deputies out in other counties um, trying to find transitional age youth shelter um, or housing. And, and some of the liaisons just quite simply say there, it, there is none. There so is none. And, 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 totally. and it's one of those things, everyone, where probably we could, we could talk about the needs um, for the rest of the afternoon. And I promised Nick that we would end at 2.30 so he could go pick up his kids. So I'm going to uh, keep us to that, Nick. Um, um, thank you, Justin. Um, thank you, Graciela. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, thank you, USF. Um, thank all of you who have been um, uh, paying attention um, with us this afternoon on a Friday. We appreciate you so much. We'll be having um, programs through the rest of the year, every third Friday. Stay tuned. Go to the surviveandthriveadvocacy.org so you can see what's coming up and sign up so you'll get notice of these. Um, I put that's also where you can find this recording later if you wish to share it. Um, also know that I, I wanted to remind everybody of the DCF hotline. If you do suspect that uh, a child is being trafficked, that's anyone under the age of 18 or a vulnerable adult. I did put the word vulnerable in there. If an, a vulnerable adult, someone who can't take care of themselves day to day um, over the age of 18, um, traffickers target uh, these folks and, and you need to make those reports to DCF. You're a mandatory reporter. Um, just want to remind you all of those resources um, that are available. There's tons of good stuff on our website. Please do that. Thank you all. Bye-bye.